Welcome back to Crime Watch. A number of women recently went public saying that they were repeatedly being stalked and intimidated by a commuter on the Gau train. We look, at the we look at stalking and ask how and why. We are joined by investigative forensic psychologist Professor Gerard Lebeskagny, an associate at the law, uh, digital law company Sarah Hoffman. Prof, uh, good seeing you again. And Sarah, Prof, stalking, define the term. Okay, uh, there's no legal definition. I'm sure Sarah will also describe in a moment. So, but typically what we say in sort of the academic literature, it's this unwanted, repeated type of contact with another person. It could be telephonic, it could be appearing in person, sending them gifts, etc., etc. So, per se, it doesn't have to be on the surface a negative behavior. So, sending someone flowers repeatedly, most people might say that's quite nice. But if it's to a married woman who doesn't want the flowers, who doesn't know who it's from, it becomes a stalking behavior. So, it's a repeated, unwanted behavior towards another individual that then starts to be, we start to talk, talk about it being a, a stalking behavior. Okay, so you have two categories depending on the circumstances and how, you, how, uh, how the person acts. So let's get into stalking in South Africa. Mm. How rife is it? Is it a problem? It is a problem. And, 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 and this was, you know, a couple of years ago, the South African Law Reform Commission looked at whether or not we should create the crime stalking. In other words, that you'll be charged with that crime, or was it not necessary? And unfortunately, in my opinion, they found that it wasn't necessary to create a crime stalking, that our existing laws can be used to deal with the various actions that the stalker engages in. And unfortunately, I don't think that was the best decision. And what they decided rather was to have uh, a protection order, and this became ultimately the Protection from Harassment Act, which people could go to the courts to seek some kind of instruction from the court to the person bothering saying stop doing one two three four five and if you don't and you continue doing that behavior you'll be arrested for contravening a court order but unfortunately that doesn't really address the stalking issue so when victims go to the police station they say I'm being stalked very often we find policemen say well there's no such crime mm -hmm. you have to go away instead of breaking it down into what has the person done that could possibly be a crime on its own do the police even open a charge should he is it not intimidation perhaps you know what we have found is that very often the victims don't get they walk away with either being told you can't open up a case. Uh, we've had one victim, such as in the, in the Gautrain stalk uh, case that you mentioned in the introduction, where the person did go to the police station, did give a statement, and a week later when we followed up, no, no, no docket had been opened. Because uh, obviously the commander who read that statement felt, well, there's no criminal behavior. And that is sometimes the problem, is that a lot of the stalking behavior doesn't equate to a criminal act. As I said, sending someone flowers over and over and over, that's not a crime. Um, but f following someone wherever they go, that's not a crime. But it's inappropriate behavior that causes fear and anxiety, and that's where we have the bigger problems. It's very easy if your stalking behavior consists of throwing a brick through someone's window, banging on their door, um, damaging their via property, calling them insulting names, exposing yourself. That's in a way easy. It's when you get this collection of behaviors that don't step into the world of a, of a con contravening a criminal act that the police seem totally paralyzed as to, as to know what to do about it. I want to pick up on the Gautrain, uh, Gautrain stalker in a moment and the law. Sarah, um, cyber stalking, does it happen and how common is it? So, so as we've just heard, you know, the, there's no set sort of legal definition for cyber stalking. In our world and in our practice, what we're seeing daily is exactly what the prof said inappropriate behavior that causes harm or the belief that harm is going to be caused and often using some sort of online platform as a mechanism to effect, to effect that harm. So a lot of the cases we deal with, for example, are very common is extortion. We actually call it sextortion, mm. where it's a very, very common scenario. Someone will meet somebody online. They will um, usually move the conversation to WhatsApp. They'll share some sort of intimate content, and all of a sudden the person who received the content is not who they said they were, they're often not the same gender or they don't match their profile picture at all and suddenly this is you know there are these huge threats to pay money to some either e-wallet or untraceable payment mechanism or else the photos will be sent to a colleague to a workplace to the wife it's often married men unfortunately who who get involved in these scams um, to you know put it on their Facebook profiles etc I mean we get probably at least one or two of these queries a week in our office and where is it popular on, on Twitter on Facebook on so Instagram the usual Which scenario is somebody meets someone on a dating platform uh, usually um, often tinder but I've, um, I've had made esteemed medical professionals. I've had really highly regarded professionals get involved in these scams. They've sometimes met someone in a professional capacity and then just started engaging in a, you know, conversation online and so on. So, so no, you know, it really happens to all sorts of people. So what happens if you're targeted? 
do you pay the money? Do you report it to the police? Um, what do we you do? We always advise people not to pay the money. We often advise people to consider deactivating your social media accounts temporarily. Um, we have had clients that before they consulted us pay the money and the only thing that happens once you pay it is you get asked for more and more money. Um, it's, we actually think there's an extortion ring operating because the modus operandi is always the same and we've had so many people targeted you know that it, it plays out always the same way so so what is the trick uh, when you get these requests don't engage them at all well don't send intimate content to people that you don't know mm -hmm. is rule number one um, if you are going to be sending intimate content make sure you know the person make sure the person wants to receive it um, and make sure that you're not identifiable in in that content in any way i want to come back to social media in a moment prof the current laws you say to us clearly are inadequate. Are there plans, to your knowledge, that uh, the uh, law reform commission perhaps uh, uh, want to bring back proper stalking laws, like we see in some of the other countries? Yeah. Um, as far as I know, not, because that's essentially what they were looking at in the I think, early 2000s and came up with a decision not to, but came up with a protection order concept. So I don't think anybody's re reviewing that issue. And it becomes a difficulty because what you might find is that a small case such as a criminal injuria case, which is insulting the dignity of, of another person, maybe swearing at them, saying sexually inappropriate things maybe, gets registered at a police station. I can promise you that's not going to get a lot of attention from the police in light of the other things they have to investigate. Then, in another police station's area, the same victim is, has a tire slashed. So it's a malicious injury to property docket. Mm -hmm. So all of these are regarded as very minor, insignificant dockets that are probably going to be closed off very quickly. What you need to actually do is to actually consolidate all of these cases together, and then you really get an idea of the, the, the impact of all of this behavior and can actually probably get somewhere in terms of criminal charges and maybe even an effective sentence. But unfortunately, that's not what's happening. Um, the police don't have a strategy in terms of how to respond to stalking behavior, and it is a labor-intensive thing to respond to, because if you are protecting individuals who are being stalked, I mean, think about it. If you phone 10 one now, what is most people's response as to how long the, it took before the police arrived? Unfortunately, quite a long time. You can't have that in response to stalking cases, specifically if it's an ex-intimate partner stalker, because they tend to be the most dangerous and life-threatening. And that's, again, why the option of a protection order, whether it's under the Domestic Violence Act or the Protection from Harassment Act, is not bulletproof. So, and, and usually taking them out really just makes somebody more angry. And, so and to get a protection order is quite, quite easy. In theory, yes. So you should be able to go to uh, the magistrate's court, you give a statement, and what should happen is if they think this is total nonsense, they don't grant you one. Okay. If they think there's merit to what you have to say, they give you an interim one, which is usually about a month, and they say, come back in a month, we're going to notify the other person to come back, and he gets a chance to and defend like himself, a which is fine. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if, and if he doesn't pitch up or he doesn't motivate himself properly, that interim order will become permanent. Um, but what we're finding, and specifically Praetorian Magistrates Court, is victims of stalking behavior, unless they go in there with bruises on their faces, get told, mm. we're not going to give you an interim order, but come back in three months' time on this date, and we'll tell the suspect to come back. So in those three months, this young lady has absolutely no protection, mm. and for three months, wh what's going to happen to her if the, sus the suspect can continue to engage in the behavior with no consequence? Now, Prof, I know you're also a psychologist by profession. What is the mindset of a stalker? Why do they do it? And how dangerous mm. are they? Look, you're going to get different types, and I think you also have to understand we can't look at stalking as, as one thing. People stalk for different reasons. The most common is your ex-intimate partner, and you probably you would have seen during the relationship controlling behavior, aggression, etc., and that just extends into the end of the relationship and afterwards. Um, so the prior inter intimates is the most common, but also the most concerning for the person's physical safety. You get casual acquaintance, someone you might just know on your way walking to work, who somehow latches on you for some reason. You get your ones in your professional capacity, so maybe a psychiatrist who has a patient that perhaps sees more in this, in this business, in this working professional relationship than really is there and says, I'm in love with my psychiatrist and I know he's in love with me. You get sort of the workplace scenario where two people might be dating, they break up, or a person fixates on the other one your random strangers which also tend to be very often sexually motivated so again the the motives are different for each one and each one needs to be assessed in its own right for what risks are we facing for this particular victim and then what decisions because sometimes the decision should be we're not going to take out a protection order but we're going to do something else other times it might be yes we're going to take out a protection order but then we have to ensure in, in addition to that, there's additional safety measures to protect this person because, as I said, people are usually angry when you take out a protection order against them. So it's not going to save you from the guy stabbing you if he wants to, but I'm not saying don't do it, but you need to know that is not mm. essentially going to protect you in certain circumstances. There needs to be the additional background support. Now, Sarah, specializing in social media law especially, so you have a stalker, you go to the... Uh Magistrates court, you can't get a protection order. Do you have any other legal recourse? I mean, uh, do we get involved with lawyers to write them letters, to bring an urgent high court application, or what can one do? 
Well, I might not be answering your question directly, but the biggest challenge we are facing with of, of facing is the anonymity crisis because so much of the cyber stalking it, you know takes place either behind an anonymous Instagram account or people will send I, I mean I, I can't tell you so how many accounts, um, fake Gmail accounts mm -hmm. fake um, Instagram accounts you name it um, you know this is uh, people who want to engage in stalking type behavior have realized that it's pretty easy to create an anonymous profile online and this is the mechanism they're using now the biggest challenge we have in our in our in you know our practice is that it's very difficult to find out behind who's behind these anonymous accounts so all of the, the these companies whether it's you know Twitter Facebook WhatsApp Instagram, you, they, they all headquartered in the US, they all have huge privacy concerns. They're not yeah. going to give the identity of any of these account holders without a court order. And I, that's I what often see people complaining about that there's yeah. no action from, from, from the social yeah. media yes. companies. But currently, our laws in South Africa, and you look at the digital uh, world, are our laws adequate? You know, laws and execution are two different things. I think we do have the laws in place. I'm not confident in the execution. In my dealings with any of these types of matters with the police, I'm totally, I've been totally disappointed. Because, because they don't regard despondent. it as a serious crime, I would imagine. I've had more success sending a threatening lawyer's letter mm -hmm. than going through the, you know, the, the police force. Because you know, I've had to tell mm -hmm. high up people in cyber crimes units where the link is on Twitter to report content if you're a law enforcement official. They'd never seen it. Now, so, Sarah, very often, especially young people, you keep your location settings on on your phone. You uh, take a, a selfie um, at a mall and you say, I'm at Senton Mall. That's quite dangerous uh, if you have these people with this mindset uh, uh, around, around town. Absolutely. So one of the number one safety tips we always give anyone we speak to is to turn off your location services. It's pretty easy to do. What a lot of people don't realize is the default is that your location services are on. So um, best to turn them off for everything except Google Maps, Uber, and you know tracking software for your phone. Prof, let's get to the how train uh, incident that you uh, that you that you worked on. What was the modus operandi of this man, and what did he do exactly? Well, essentially, we actually it turns out have four different people stalking, harassing women on the how train since about 2017 up until fairly recently this year. The, out of those four suspects, I think um, about 12 of them have been definitely stalked by the same individual. We've confirmed that through photographs that they've taken of the person, etc. And what this individual would do: would typically, um, you know, approach them, sit down next to them, stare at them, start to ask sort of very personal questions, which are not inappropriately, for example sexually but so where do you stay you know are you married questions that you wouldn't normally ask on the first sort of in a business environment mm. which is actually what the train is it's not a dating train it's a business train then follow them follow them to their work wait for them as they come up the, from the escalators downstairs um, as I said follow them into their workplace make sure that if they see this person get onto the train they would get onto the same carriage and when the victim would move to a different carriage this person would fall into the carriage so did the victims open criminal charges what happened no well that's the problem most of these victims either think you know the police aren't going to do anything for them which sadly is, is my experience and it sounds like it's also Sarah's experience is that the police are not going to help them and that's that's unfortunately the experience not just my impression um, so in this one particular instance one lady from this year did go to the police Brooklyn police station gave a sworn statement this was in uh, I think end of January beginning of Feb and a week later no docket had been opened nothing <laughs> ever since then uh, she went back later to try again and had a very unfortunate incident where the, the police tried to arrest her husband in the police charge office because he took a photograph of the captain who was supposed to be helping them. Um, so that led to charges against him. So it just became this bizarre circle of events. And it's also the same lady who, when she tried to get a protection order, was told, nope, we're not going to grant you one. But come back in two months' time on this date. We'll tell the stalker to be here. But the problem with protection orders in this scenario is that the victims and the how train, the suspect doesn't often know their name. So they have a certain level of anonymity. On a protection order, the victim's name, ID number, and address is reflected on the protection mm. order because you have to tell the suspect you need to stay away from this person who lives here so, they, can, dangerous. so they know who to stay. So mm. now you're essentially giving a stalker mm. personal information exactly about where you are. So what woman would want to do that in, in a situation where they have a degree of anonymity? Now, um, I believe that you met the stalker uh, or alleged stalker. Uh, what was his reaction when you confronted him, Prof? Yes, yeah, so essentially what led to that is that um, after, unfortunately, there was no progression in terms of 
either police side, we were not very happy with how Train was dealing with it, but I don't want to get into that because they're not here to defend themselves. Um, but essentially, um, the Sunday Times then ran an article, they interviewed some of these ladies, and as a result of that, um, I think this person obviously saw the article, his name was not mentioned, although we knew from day one who he was and where he stayed and where he worked, etc., and he worked at a law firm in, in Santon. Um, and my name was mentioned in the article, of course, also, and I get a phone call from a person, I think about four days later on the Thursday after the Sunday publication, and eventually I hear this person, and I couldn't quite figure out what they're talking about until he says, I agree to stay off the train. And I said, hello, is this Mr. So-and-so? And he said, yes, it is. And he said, look, there's a big misunderstanding. Um, he is the person mentioned in the article, but he hasn't stalked anybody. He's, perhaps his behaviors have been misinterpreted. But for everybody's comfort, he agrees to stay off the train. So I said, okay, fine. Can I meet you tomorrow morning, which is the Friday morning? And I drew up a, sh a short little uh, agreement yeah. uh, that he basically signed saying he promises to stay off the train, although it's not him, he, to make everybody feel better. And he signed that, and then I witnessed that, and I gave that to the Hau train. And the reaction of the Hau train uh, administration? Again, don't go too much into it. They weren't, they weren't very happy f with me. They still see me as interfering with <laughs> their processes, and they're welcome to, to, to answer that. But again, the question is, why are all these victims getting hold of me and, and not them? Sure, because they needed help. Sarah? Very often it's men stalking women. Uh, is that what you find also on social media? Yes. I mean, again, I think the, the cases of stalking that we deal with are quite different to what we've been discussing, you know, for, mm. in these examples. But, uh, you know, the, the kind of cyber stalking I might deal with quite frequently is pressuring to send intimate content. We spoke about the extortion when you have intimate content. Um, other kinds of behavior we're seeing are... Um, again, this is often with an angry ex-intimate mm. partner, taking somebody's personal information and often a photograph and putting, putting sex adverts up for, mm. adverts up for them, yeah. putting adverts on dating websites with personal information like a phone number and a photograph. Um, so, you know, I think this is a type of stalking behavior. Mm. Mm, um, it's certainly predatory. And um, mm. Unfortunately, it often is it often is men against women. But I've, we had a we had a case earlier this year where it it was um, quite a well known um, male quite a well known person male person in the media industry, and he had a a fan girl who who really just couldn't accept that she was only going to be a fan girl. And th th I mean, her her behaviour was nothing short of online stalking. Um, so so it it can happen. Uh, you know, from both genders to answer your question. Prof, is there a correlation between gender-based violence and stalking? Yeah. Definitely from the intimate partner stalkers, what you would see, the ones who stalk their ex-girlfriends -girl or wives after the relationship has ended, I would say probably 90% of the time we saw inappropriate behavior towards the partner during the relationship. As I said, controlling behavior for domestic violence uh, and those types of things. And that's often the reason why the person left the relationship. And that just changes format once they break up and they become stalking, harassing behavior to but kind of ruin their life, like you say, putting pictures out there in different places, mm -hmm. threatening them when they want to get into a new relationship, etc. But I also want to add on, 100% agree that, you know, most of the stalking that I've come across is, is male offenders, but when you get a, a female stalker, mm -hmm. they do it incredibly well. Prof, uh, just the other day uh, we saw media reports of a man masturbating at a gym in yeah. Stellenbosch in the Western Cape. Um, there again, uh, very weird behavior by people, and, but we saw swift action in that yeah. particular case. I think definitely uh, the, the, the gym in that particular scenario should be commended. They, they immediately, I think there was a criminal case opened up, but they immediately banned this guy from their pre premises for life. And that's the kind of steps you want to see. You don't have to wait for a criminal case or to, be, to open mm. one up, to have it concluded and have a conviction. And many of the behaviors we engage in can get us trouble even though they're not criminal. I always say in a workplace environment, if a manager asks a junior person out on a date, that's not illegal, but it'll get you fired because in that context it's inappropriate. So if people are doing these things in your environment, whether it's customers on your premises towards each other or your staff or customer to your staff, you need to take steps to immediately to get that person use right of admission and other basically agreements that if you're going to use my services, you agree to behave in this way and you need to go. Sarah, very quickly, do we need a register of stalkers? I can't imagine it would be a bad thing. Mm. I'd defer to, to mm. the well, I think expert even, over here, but I, I would imagine yeah. it, it would probably be a very good thing. Well, how about a register of people who've had protection orders taken out against them? There we go. Something to think about. Uh, Professor Gerald Lewis-Kachny, as always, thank you for joining us, and as well as to Sarah Hoffman, uh, and thank you for their insights. After the break, we focus on missing and wanted.